welcome to Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> if you'd like to say these words, let's stand and worship together. Hey James, will you uh, click that thing? Which one is that? <laughs>
Good morning, Great Water. If I haven't met you, uh, my name is Eric Chappelle. I'm a pastor of your closest neighboring church. Uh, we actually meet in the same building as you, uh, just at 11 o'clock. And um, uh, it's, you know, Michael, I'd like to give the announcements uh, this morning. And thanks for welcoming me. And uh, we've been, my son and I have been worshiping with you for the last uh, couple Sundays and benefiting from Roger's reflections uh, on the prodigal son. Um, so just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, you know, everybody everybody has a calendar, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but everybody utilizes some sort of calendar. Your calendar could be sorted by, you know, people's birthdays or family members' birthdays, friends' birthdays. Uh, it could just be, your calendar could just be work meetings and Zoom calls and all of the things you need to take care of in any given day. And everybody has a calendar, and, you know, um, most of the world celebrates certain events. There's an event, I'm told, that's going on this afternoon that many people mark on their calendar. Um, but we all divide time somehow, right? Uh, and for, you know, for the better part of the last 2,000 years, uh, the church has also seen a benefit uh, to thinking about time, thinking about our annual year through the lens of Jesus Christ, through the lens of the gospel, the person and work of Jesus. And so probably many of you are familiar with things like Christmas and Easter and um, celebrating the birth of Jesus, which is in, in so important and entirely appropriate, uh, or his resurrection from the dead after uh, he died on the cross and made atonement for sins. Um, but there's a whole sort of depth to understanding the life of Christ and the person of Christ and what he's come to do. Uh, and one of the things um, that you can trace back in the history of the church, all the way to the third century, in fact, there was this council called the Council of Nicaea, which met together and defended uh, the, the person of Jesus, the doctrine of the incarnation, the doctrine that Jesus was, in fact, true God, the very Son of God. And one of the things that they discussed in that council was also, the word, one of the things they mentioned, was also this period up to Easter, the celebration of Easter, the resurrection, uh, which they called Lent. Uh, and it was a season, really, of self-reflection. It was this time where uh, new Christians would contemplate the cost of following Jesus uh, in anticipation of their baptism on Easter Sunday. And so the church for many years recognized this sort of 40-day period called Lent. And uh, the, the beginning of that season is often called Ash Wednesday. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that or maybe even grew up in a church where Ash Wednesday services were held. Well, our church, El Camino, is hosting an Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday. It's also Valentine's Day. Remember how I said everybody has a calendar. Everybody uh, marks time in some way. Um, and at our service, you know, as a pastor who's starting a new church, as many of you have been at Great Water for a long time and uh, helped start this church, you have to think through, well, what, what, is the, what is the central message that we want to communicate to people? And sometimes at Ash Wednesday services, um, uh, that, that moment or that service will be marked by the sign of the cross in ashes on people's forehead, um, which, is, which is fine and entirely appropriate. But I, maybe you might catch this later on in the sermon, I imagine. But the central message of Christianity is that Jesus is throwing a feast. He's inviting you to a table. Uh, and so as a church, as a you know, we've, 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 we've thought a lot about this and said, you know, what are the things that we most want to communicate to the world, to people in our church? And that is that they've been invited to a banquet, to a feast. And so at our Ash Wednesday service, if you're unfamiliar, but you're interested in checking it out, uh, there's not going to be any ashes. There's not going to be any signs of the cross on your forehead. There will be uh, an invitation to come to the table and to have uh, the body and blood of Jesus, uh, the bread and the wine, given for you as a, as a sign, as a token, as a seal of how Jesus has loved you so much, how he's been forsaken so that you could be accepted. So I would love to invite you to that. You're welcome to come. It's going to be from 5 to 6 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, and then after service today, some, as some of you know, our two churches have been sharing this series on the prodigal son. I hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have. Um, but we thought, what better way to apply the parable of the prodigal son uh, than with a feast, than with a meal. So if you are free uh, at, at about 1230 this afternoon, we would love for you to come back. 
or even stay and um, join us with a, in a meal together. Um, and then, if I could maybe invite you as well, uh, we're also we're, we're sharing a series upcoming, which is our next series, um, and it's on the prophet Habakkuk, um, or it's probably better pronounced Habakkuk, but I'll let Roger talk about that a little bit. Um, but Habakkuk is a minor prophet in the Old Testament, and he lived 1,500 years ago when his nation, when his kingdom, was unraveling at the seams, where everything politically, religiously, culturally was falling apart. Um, and I don't know if that resonates with you, but as you look out in the world, uh, think about what you see, and maybe, perhaps maybe, as we reflect together on this short little prophetical book in the Old Testament, you might catch some really ancient wisdom for how to follow Jesus in times like those. So, with that said, uh, I'm going to invite uh, these two young men up, and they're going to take the offering. Uh, remember what the Apostle Paul says. He says that Christians give uh, not out of fear, not out of sort of like the older son and the prodigal son in order to gain something from their father, but we give because God has been so generous to us. Uh, Paul says in Corinthians that Jesus, who had all the riches in the world, became poor so that you and I can become rich. And that's the, the primary motive that... Christians have. We, we love, we serve, we give, not in order to gain something, but because we've been given everything uh, by the Father. So I'm going to pray over this offering, and then these two young men are going to um, serve us and bless us in that way. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for Jesus, the Prince of the world, uh, the ruler of all things, um, who became poor, who lowered himself, uh, denied himself, emptied himself, even Father so that we could be filled up, so that we could be made rich. Uh, Father, we ask that you would bless this time of giving of our offerings. Um, Father, we know that everything that we have is a gift from you. So Father, would you bless uh, this work? Would you bless the labors of Great Water Community Church um, in all the various facets and ministries that uh, you have um, guided them in, led them in, and brought them in? Father, would you bring great fruitfulness and great faithfulness um, from uh, from from this giving today, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Kids, so that we can remember God and thank Him. 
uh, for welcoming us <coughs> home, welcoming, welcoming us to a party. So uh, uh, today you're going to go up and help Mr. Joe uh, with the, the final song today. And Mr. Joe is back there. And uh, that's going to help us in our celebration, in our party. We're going we're gonna to sing together and, and thank God for the party that he throws for us. So let's stand up. Everybody stand up. <coughs> and uh, let's, let's, let's hold hands. Want to hold hands, Koa? And let's, let's lead everybody in prayer. Let's go to the party. We're going to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, Mr. Joe, come on down. you got some great voices today. I'm going to lead us in the closing song of celebration. Here comes Mr. Joe. Come on, this Come right way. Come on, 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 Come Well, greetings, mighty warriors. Greetings. The Lord is with you. Hope you had a great week. Um, our scripture text today is, uh, this is part five of five parts on the, the, the prodigal son. And we're looking at Luke 15, 22 to 24. Luke 15, 22 to 24. We've looked at uh, what it means to be lost, what it means to be found. Uh, we've looked at uh, the younger son, uh, we've looked at the older son, we've looked at the father, and today we're going to look at the celebration, and this is, this is the heart of the message of the prodigal son. Verse 22, Luke 15, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. May the Lord speak to us this morning through his word and by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So today, Super Bowl Sunday, Super Bowl number 58, held at the Legion Stadium in Las Vegas. Kansas City Chiefs, San Francisco 49ers. Uh, this is a rematch of Super Bowl 54. I think the Chiefs won that one. Uh, the stadium uh, seats 72,000 people, and it's expected that it will be completely filled. Uh, the Columbia Broadcast System has 165 cameras that cover every square inch of the stadium. It's going to be broadcast around the entire world. Uh, there's supposedly going to be about 200 million Americans uh, watching it on television this afternoon. I'll probably be one of them. Um, if you had wanted to have an advertisement uh, for the Super Bowl for your business or company, it would only set you back a mere $7 million for 30 seconds. If you had wanted to purchase a ticket, uh, for the Super Bowl. The, the cheapest one was $2,000, and they, they went up to about $45,000, and that's, be, that's before the scalpers got a hold of them. Those were the legitimate prices. When I was a little boy, I remember watching Super Bowl I on, on television. It was black and white television, and the, and the game was the Green Bay Packers against the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> way back in 1967, and the, pro the most expensive ticket then was $90 to go to the game. Times have changed, haven't they? That, that game has taken on some, uh, 
importance, I guess, in, in, in our world. But imagine if nobody showed up to the Super Bowl today. Nobody went to the stadium. Nobody, nobody turned their TV on to watch the game. Wouldn't that be a sight to behold? All that advertisement, all that money, all that folder all for nothing. The National Football League, the executives would be devastated, crushed. We celebrate a lot of things as, as people. We, we uh, celebrate births, we celebrate marriages, engagements, quinceaneros. We celebrate uh, high school graduations, college graduations, getting a promotion at work, high school reunions, 50th wedding anniversaries. We, we celebrate a lot of things, and I'll bet some of you have put a lot of energy and time and effort into hosting a feast, hosting a celebration, and then maybe we're disappointed because some of the people that you hoped would come didn't show up. Has that ever happened to anybody? You know, had some, had some disappointments there. And um, celebrations <coughs> involve people, people <coughs> coming together. And the very heart of this parable is the God of the universe is hosting a feast. And he wants people to come. And as Jesus finished telling this story of the prodigal son, he's looking at the religious leaders of the day and they're saying, are you going to come to God's feast? God loves you and he's prepared a wonderful celebration. Are you going to come? And that's the question that each of us have to answer. Are we going to come to the feast that, that God is throwing? So as we finish up this last part of a five-part series, uh, we're once again uh, looking at uh, the Father in this parable who is uh, a symbol of the Lord our God. And the Father uh, does three things as we think about this. He tells us why we celebrate. He shows us how to celebrate. And then he celebrates. So that's what we're going to look at today, why we celebrate, how to celebrate, and then let's do it. Uh, Joe told me the other day, break out the chip and dips, you know, we're going to, we're going to celebrate. So uh, why do we celebrate? We celebrate because something that was lost was found. And there are three parables right in a row. The shepherd lost a sheep. He had a hundred sheep, he lost one. He spent all day looking for that sheep, and when he found it, he put it right around his neck and carried it back home, and he said to his friends and neighbors, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. And then when the woman lost part of her inheritance, when she lost her silver coin, she looked all day for that coin, and when she found it, she got all excited, and she said, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. And so in, our, the, in the prodigal son, the father's heart was broken. He was looking over the horizon for his long lost son. And when finally he saw him drag him back home, he got all excited. He jumped up out of his chair and he ran off to greet his son. And he said, quick, uh, break out the finest robe and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and let's slaughter the fatted calf for this son of mine who was dead. He's come alive again. My son who was lost has been found. And that's why God celebrates. Something that was lost has been found. Somebody who was away from God, away from God's kingdom, dead in their sins, came back home. And, and God uh, celebrated. That is why uh, we, we celebrate. <coughs> um, the father was a wealthy man. You know, you read, you read the parable, and the parable says he divided his estate uh, between his sons, and the younger son took his share 
of the estate and went off to a distant land. I'm sure it cost a lot of money. It cost a lot of money to travel. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Took a, took, the younger son uh, took, took the estate and traveled to a distant country, and he was gone for a long, long time. It took quite some time for him to squander uh, the inheritance that his father gave him. A lot of life situations happened during the time he was away. And then he gets to thinking, man, my dad's got some hired servants who got it better off than I do right now. And, and for a man to have hired servants they implied a significant amount of wealth. So the father in this parable was wealthy. Once again, I want you to look at, at uh, Rembrandt's painting, the, the, prophet, the Return of the Prodigal Son. And uh, you see the wealth of the father in this parable. You see the expensive robe, that's he, that he's wearing. Uh, you see the expensive robe that the elder brother is wearing. And the, the third man in the middle, who's actually Rembrandt himself, uh, is also decked out in very expensive clothes. Uh, this is a, the, the original hangs in uh, the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And you can't really see all the details of this painting on, on images that we put on the screen. But if you were to go to the Hermitage, and maybe you can catch it uh, in this uh, a little bit as well, there are actually two women in the background. Uh, one on the upper left-hand corner, and then one, one right in the middle of the, of the portrait. And these women are leaning against an arch. And it's an arch befitting of a palace, not a farmhouse. And so Rembrandt captures the wealth of, of the father in this portrait. The God of the universe is wealthy. The God of the universe is infinite <laughs> in his grace and in his mercy. He's rich. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and that's not meant to be taken literally. The Lord our God owns it all, and he wants, he wants to bless you with the gifts of his kingdom. He wants, he wants to give you uh, his wealth. And so, uh, as you read the story here, he's almost impatient with desire as he sees his younger son coming. Quick! Get the best robe! The best robe would have been his robe. I want to, my son's come back, I want to give him the absolute best I can possibly give him. Nothing is too good for my son. I want him to have it all. And he, and he lavished it on him. He gave him. And so, people like to party, don't they? <laughs> there's, there's people that their whole lives are marked by partying. And I, I had a, and, and, and it becomes kind of vanity <laughs> to party all the time. I had a church secretary once. Her name was Betty Davis. And <laughs> my church secretary often would say, too many parties without any fun. Too many bright lights without any sun. And, you know, when you party all the time, you lose the specialness of it. A, a party is something important. A celebration is something important. It breaks the norm. And God celebrates the return of his son. God celebrates uh, that which was dead and has now become alive. That which is lost has been found. That is why the God of the universe is throwing a party. Because somebody's come home. Amen? Amen. Somebody's come home to the king. And then he shows us how uh, to celebrate. And when we, when we really celebrate, we get all dressed up, don't we? You like to get dressed up? And when we, when we celebrate, we like to eat. Those are the two things that kind of break the routineness of life. When something special happens, we get decked out and, and we want to eat. So the father took the best robe, which was his own robe, and, and put it on his son. And uh, I imagine uh, a, a lady's wedding day is important. You, you put on a beautiful gown. Guys, 
You like it too, guys. I know you do. Getting, getting, getting dressed up once in a while. Doesn't it feel good to, to do the hair and the makeup and have a nice gown on? Or, or guys to have that nice fitting tuxedo or, or suit? That once in a while, it's good. It's a, it's, a, it's a celebrative thing. I asked James today to show the, about the last picture uh, taken of me on active duty. Uh, Uncle Sam knows how to deck out his sailors and soldiers. You know, that's, that's full dress white there. Egg, egg, scrambled eggs on a hat and ribbons and medals. You know, Uncle Sam knows how to do it. God the Father clothes with righteousness uh, the men and women who come home to him and, uh, and want to get serious and want to get right with God. The angels in heaven rejoice when someone comes home. God also, the, the man in this parable also put a ring on the finger of, of the son that had come home. The signet ring, the family ring, the ring that signifies authority. And I, I imagine there's many in this room who may have some a necklace or earrings or a ring or some piece of jewelry that has been passed down uh, for generations through your family and is very, very meaningful, it's powerful. And uh, when, when Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt and when he ultimately interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and the land of Egypt was spared the ravages of a famine because of, because of Joseph's interpretations of, of, of the dreams, uh, Pharaoh made him number one in the kingdom of Egypt, and he gave him his ring, his signet ring. One of the things they give you at the Naval Academy when you graduate is this big gold ring. You know, can you hear that? There's, there's some gold in there, and there's jewels in it. You know, and they, they call graduates from the Naval Academy ring knockers. Because when we get together, we like, we like to shake our rings. But it's, 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 it's a symbol of, of some sort of accomplishment, something, something important. So God clothes his people with garments of righteousness. He gives, he gives rings of authority. He puts them on, on our fingers. And he, he puts shoes on our feet. And, and back in the, in the day when Jesus told this story, poor people didn't have shoes. Slaves didn't have shoes. And so the father says, bring out the shoes and put them on the feet of my son. My son is now free. My son is, uh, is, uh, is, is blessed. He's, he's come back home. Uh, shoes uh, symbolize power and, and authority. Uh, shoes are, are for the wealthy and for the powerful, especially back in the day. And uh, uh, Ferdinand Marcos was the dictator in the Philippines for over 20 years. He absconded with billions of dollars from, uh, from the Filipino citizens' uh, treasury. And uh, when they finally arrested him uh, and they went into the palace where he lived, the authorities went into Imelda Marcos's a closet and they found 3,000 pairs of shoes in Mrs. Marcos's uh, closet. You know, you know, Uncle Sam knows how to, how to give his property shoes. Too. Look at these. Isn't that, a good, isn't that a good spit shine? That's not really spit shine. That's a patent letter. But, but, uh, but God decks us out, decks us out in, in shoes as well. He puts the best robe on his children. He puts a ring on the finger. He puts, uh, he puts shoes on the feet, a robe of honor, a ring of inheritance, footwear of prestige. It's time to celebrate. Let's get gussied up. Let's be looking good. You know, and the God of the universe clothes us. There's a fascinating story in the Bible, if you can find Zechariah, uh, second to the last book of the Old Testament. Uh, the nation of Israel, if you know your history, was destroyed in 587 BC was destroyed by the Babylonians. The temple was raised. The, one of the wonders of the world was completely destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and all the gold and everything that was in it was plundered. But 70 years later, the nation of Israel was allowed to go back to their land and rebuild the temple. And Zechariah records much of the Israel's return to the land and the rebuilding of the temple. And in Zechariah chapter 3, 
he, he talks about the very first high priest who, who, who began his ministry in that rebuilt temple. His name was Joshua. So Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, the angel showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The devil never wants anybody to celebrate. The devil hates laughter. The devil wants you to be depressed and in despair all the time. But the Lord, verse 2, said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not, is this, is not this man, uh, Joshua, a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I've taken away your sin. I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. When you come home, God will clothe you. God will bless you. God will, God will celebrate you. Then the th second thing we do at feasts or at celebration is, is eat. Man, Thanksgiving meals, how many of y'all like Thanksgiving? You know, and the, the family comes around, the kids, the grandkids, and the, man, the eating, the chowing down, the turkey, the, all the fixings, it's just wonderful when we feast. By the way, we had a feast yesterday, didn't we, Yvonne? You know, we, we, several of us went to uh, Solutions for Change. And uh, Solutions for Change is this incredible program it gets people off the streets in, in North County and sets them on a path for success. 700 days of rehabilitation, and they get them jobs, they get them houses to live in, they reunite the families. So about the first month of that, uh, they're, they're just welcome and they're just blessed. And so many from our congregation came in yesterday and, and threw out a feast. And the men and women who've been homeless on the streets, little children, I mean, half, the, half of it was little children on the streets, and they were there at Solutions for Change, and, and, and we had a feast. We celebrated because they had a desire to come home and get their lives straight, and uh, we sat down at the tables and ate with them and heard their stories, and this is what, this is what the parable's about. It's about celebrating, getting, getting dressed up and eating and, and enjoying uh, the kingdom of God. Um, Carl and Marines know how to do this, don't they? They know how to eat. Every, every year, the uh, Marine Corps has the, the Marine Corps ball. And uh, James, we've got an image of uh, the table set up for the Marine Corps ball there. Ch check that out. That's, that's how they do it. All around the world, wherever the Marines are, they put on an elegant spread. If you ever get a chance to go to a Marine Corps ball, go to one. It's, it's an incredible thing. It's a real, it's a real celebration. And sometimes they have plated, you know, servants bring plates to you and set it before you. Sometimes there's a buffet. And man, when there's a buffet, you ought to see those Marines chow down. It's, it's, a, it's a time of celebration. Slaughter the fatted calf is what the father uh, said when his son came home. And Pastor Peter pointed out to me during the week, he said it was the fatted calf. There was one calf that was being reserved for a very special occasion. And this, the occasion was the son who was lost coming home. So the father uh, celebrates when we decide to come home. He shows us how to celebrate. And then verse 24, uh, they began to celebrate. Jesus is describing a party where all the stops are pulled out. The father wants his son to have such a feast as had never been celebrated before. An abundance of food and music and drink. Happy party noises can be heard far beyond the house. Rejoice with me. I found my sheep. Rejoice with me. I found my coin. Rejoice with me. I have found my son. And the beauty of God's celebration is it starts happening right now. The, the moment you turn your heart over to the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment you come home, uh, 
God begins to celebrate. And it's something that carries on into glory. The very first miracle that Jesus ever did was turning water into wine at a marriage celebration. The feast to which Jesus invites us begins right now. It's, it's, it's a joyful gathering uh, to all who belong to God's kingdom. God rejoices not because all the problems of the world have been solved, and not because human pain and suffering have come to an end, not because thousands of people have been converted and are praising him for his goodness, not because the church is packed every Sunday and people are hanging out the windows. God is rejoicing because one of his children who was lost has been found. And we are called to enter in to that joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. But not everybody comes to the feast. <clears throat> it breaks God's heart when human beings made in his image uh, don't come home, don't show up to the feast. The older brother stayed outside. He didn't want to celebrate when his younger brother came home. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus tells us a similar story about a king who threw a great banquet. And he said, everything is ready. The oxen and the fatted calf have been prepared. Come to the feast. But many weren't interested. They were too busy with their own affairs. God wants us to celebrate. Uh, we have become so accustomed to sadness, war, injustice, political machinations. Do you want to be filled with the newspaper news every day? Do you want to be filled with the internet news and Google search and all the stuff that comes over social media? Or do you want to hear God's news? Choose, choose the light, even when there's so much darkness in this world that frightens. Don't let anybody steal your joy. As Christians, we are not naive to the things of this world. We choose to follow the light. The light that shines in the darkness is, is far more to be trusted uh, than the darknesses of this world. A little bit of light can cast out a whole lot of darkness. There, in our lives today, there is rarely a moment when we're not bombarded with cynicism, sadness, melancholy, depression. But you know something, church? My father has already put his cloak over me. He's already put a ring on my finger. He's already put sandals on my feet. The hands that we talked about last week uh, have become my hands, the hands of the Father. This, this makes our faith so much more unique than anything else in the world. Uh, Eastern religions tell us that the world is an illusion. Greek philosophy tells us that this world is a temporary, temporary copy of the real world, the ideal world. But what Jesus is telling us is this world matters. Uh, this, he redeems us, soul and body. Jesus did two things. He preached good news, and he also healed the sick. He talked of another world, but he also was in this world. And this is why, this is why we remember the Sabbath. Thanks for coming every Sunday to worship our King. It's only one hour, you know, and, and many people in our culture today make church the last priority. The church and our worship is the celebration. The king is inviting you to a feast. It should be number one in our priorities, not something to do if there's a, uh, you know, if, as a last resort. It's a high priority. Once a week for an hour to compete with the chaos of this world, we need it. We need the light of God to combat the chaos of our world. And this is why we reach out to the community like we did yesterday and like we do with Tri-City Pantry and so many other things because our, because our ministry in the world, our ministry in the community is something that Jesus did and it's something that, that honors God. We are generous because God is generous. Feasting is communal by nature. Nobody, nobody has a party by themselves. It's not fun all alone. It's with other people. 
Uh, but we live in a culture today where the desires of the individual take precedence over the family, over the community, over the group. We want to be, we want to achieve spiritual growth while being independent of the church. It's just me and Jesus. Uh, but it takes a community to know an individual. I, Jackie and I have been married going on 41 years now. And I know her, yeah, that's a good time. That's, that's a long time, yeah. Uh, and I know her better than I know anybody else. And she knows me better than she knows anybody else. Um, but you know what's neat is when we're in a group and engaging with, with, with others in conversation, I begin to see other aspects of my wife that I never saw before because of the, because of the group dynamic. And the same is, is true with Jesus. If you want to get to know Jesus, you get to know him in community. Social media doesn't cut it. You can't stay home watching church on TV. It, it may give you some head knowledge, but it doesn't deal with the heart. It doesn't, it doesn't transform you. And uh, so in, in the prodigal son, Jesus says there's two ways to be cut off from, from the celebration of the father. One's to simply rebel and, and be like the younger brother. And the other is to just harden your heart and I don't need church because there's all kinds of problems in church. I'm just going to stand outside and I'll watch it. I'll watch it on the internet. Neither one of those are good approaches. God is calling you home. Uh, the, the celebrations that happen in this life uh, point us to something greater. Among the last words that Jesus ever spoke uh, was uh, on Thursday night, the night before his crucifixion, and he held up the cup. And one of the words he said was, never again will I drink of this cup until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. He was pointing to an even greater celebration. He was, he was pointing to the marriage supper of the Lamb that we read about in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, the angel in Revelation 19 said, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Anybody going to the marriage supper of the Lamb here? Can I get a hallelujah and an amen? You know, we're, we're headed there, the, the ultimate celebration. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus tells us that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And when that final feast arrives, ladies and gentlemen, we will see the end of disease, poverty, injustice, violence, suffering, and death. The climax of history is not some disembodied experience, but a celebration. Hallelujah! The marriage supper of the Lamb has come. In 1958, there was an author, by a Danish author by the name of Isaac Dennison, who wrote a, a, a little short story called Bobette's Feast, and uh, was later turned into a movie. Anybody happen to see that movie, Bobette's Feast? Well, put that on your put that on your watch list. list. It's it's pretty powerful. Uh, Bobette was a political refugee from France, and she had fled to Western Denmark. And in Denmark, she became the servant of two elderly women who ran a very strict religious and, and moral community. You were afraid to look cross-eyed at anybody, you might be judged. It was just a, a, a strict religious community. These two elder women had uh, inherited this community from their father, who was, the, who was the founder of the community. And Bobette, actually won the lottery when she was in Denmark. I'm sure the two elderly ladies looked down their noses at someone even playing the lottery. But Babette won the lottery, and she had an incredible amount of money, and she could have easily gone back to her native country of France. But instead, she offered to pay for and prepare an anniversary dinner for the for the father of these two ladies, and open it up to the entire community. And it turned out that Bobette was one of 
Paris's greatest chefs. And they sat down for a gourmet feast. And as the power of the feast began to break through the defenses of people, some of the people who had turned their back on that religious community uh, years earlier um, began to soften. And some of those who had stuck with that very strict religious community over the years uh, said, hey, this is OK. This is good. And as the feast continued, you began to see morality and joy coming together. Uh, you began to see the ethical and the sensual meeting. There's a, there's a great psalm, Psalm 85, that says, uh, God's salvation is near. It's a place where love and faithfulness meet together. It's a place where righteousness and peace kiss each other. And Jesus is the master of the banquet. Jesus is the one who brings us together. That's why we worship. There's, there's people in this congregation, and not any congregation, probably wouldn't talk to each other outside of the feast that we have on Sunday morning. But God brings us together, no matter what our political spectrum is, whatever our background is, the Lord our God celebrates us and, and brings us together, and we can see joy, and we can, we can understand each other. And Jesus in John uh, chapter 7, verse 51, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. I'm going to finish with one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. It's Isaiah uh, chapter 25. Isaiah chapter 25. Uh, these words were written about 700 years before Christ. And beginning with verse 6, the great prophet says, out of this mountain, the Lord, and he's pointing to Mount Zion, he's pointing to where Jerusalem is. And Isaiah says, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. 700 years before it happened. On this mountain, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. On that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The king is throwing a feast. He's inviting, he's inviting the arrogant. He's inviting the rebel. He's inviting the proud. He's inviting the judgmental. He's inviting the selfish. He's inviting you. He's inviting me. Uh, and the access to this feast comes by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only begotten Son of the Father. Are you going? Are you going to the feast? Are you going to attend? Are you inviting other people in your community to come to this feast and celebrate with you? Hallelujah. The marriage supper of the Lamb has come. Amen? Amen. Parable of the prodigal son. Woo! Good stuff. Thanks, Pastor Eric, for choosing that for a sermon series. That's a good one. Any, uh, any comments, thoughts, questions? Insights, Tom. I wonder if uh, the story is kind of left out there in the wind because we don't know if the older brother came around. Yeah. And we don't know if he eventually became a father and how he reacted his son. Yeah. Father, right? Yeah. So it's it's amazing how these stories uh, connect with your own yeah. life. Yeah. Right. My yeah. family's life with. Uh, the, the difficulties of my three brothers and their addictions and how it, how it destroyed, for the time being, the relationship with their sisters. Yeah. Who were always on their mother, right? Hey, you gotta, you gotta stop it. You gotta stop this. <laughs> yeah. Then they became parents. Yeah. And two of them had the same problem. <laughs> so they're in there, you know, yeah. bringing their kids home, right? Yeah. 
So it's it's amazing how the the stories connect with the day to day life we all experience. And and the beauty of it, the story and of the gospel, is the door is always open. Hundred percent. You can always come home. Anybody else thoughts or insights? We good. So Lord, we uh, thank you for the greatest story ever told. We thank you for Jesus, the Messiah, who told this story and invites all of us to come home. Thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for rising from the dead, destroying the shroud that enfolds all people. Thank you for living again and offering each and every one of us life, life abundant, life eternal. Help us to be faithful in celebrating you every week. Help us to be faithful in reaching out to our community and blessing those who, are, who do not have what we have but want to change their lives. Thank you for being our King and our God. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, come on in, boys. You're ready to sing. We're going to celebrate. <laughs>
about 600 BC, you had Assyria, you had Babylon, you had Egypt, and you had the kingdom of Judah that had been around for 350 years. And within 70 years, all of those kingdoms were gone. A turbulent, turbulent time. The end of Habakkuk, let me read this to you just to give you a little teaser. It says, though the fig tree does not bud, and though there are no grapes on the vine, and though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, and though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle uh, in the stalls, I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And so, despite all the chaos you see around you, the Lord our God is still on the throne. Amen. And that's, that's what Habakkuk's about. We're going to have an exciting four-part series on it. So read ahead and, and jump in with us. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We have prayer partners up front if you'd like prayer. If you're a first-time visitor, see Pastor Pete back there. He's got a little gift for you. And uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thanks for coming.